delicious cupcakes and cookies celebrating our IB diploma candidates who successfully completed that milestone. We're going to start in a couple minutes with our spotlight presentation of our IB diploma recipients. National Baccalaureate Diploma Program, we had 224 students taking 470 IB course examinations. In each course, students complete both internal assessments like oral examinations, math reports, individual experimentations, as well as external assessments, which are the slew of tests in May. We are here today, though, to celebrate our 15 diploma recipients. These students were required to successfully complete three standard level courses, which were one or two years, and three higher level courses, which were each two years in length, from five different categories, which included studies in language and literature, language acquisition, individuals and societies, science, mathematics, and art. Eight of our diploma recipients chose to take four higher level courses rather than the three that IB requires. Five of our diploma recipients chose to take an extra standard level course that didn't even count towards their diploma. Um, four of our diploma recipients earned the bilingual diploma for being fluent in Spanish as well as English. In addition to their required coursework, the diploma recipients were also required to complete a course titled Theory of Knowledge that looks at the way that we know things and the areas where knowledge stems from. They each completed an extended essay, which is a 4,000-word research report of their choice, completed outside of their coursework, and they completed a project in creativity, activity, and service. Through all of these, um, students earned points, and the minimum points required to earn the diploma was 24, with a maximum being 45. This year's diploma recipients earned an average of 28 points, and our highest scorer earned 34 points. So I will start listing off names, if that's all right. And we're going to go reverse alphabetical order. So Sam, you come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sam Yu Yanamandra. Um, I just wanted to thank my parents, Mina Dandabuthala and Murthy Yanamandra. I will be attending Vanderbilt University to major in medicine, health, and society on the pre-med track. Um, I'm most thankful for IB for teaching me to learn more effectively and to stick to deadlines. <laughs> Thank you. Annika. I'm Annika Vignes. I'd like to thank my parents, Beverly and Richard Vignes. Um, next year, I'll be attending the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, studying biomedical engineering. And one thing that the IB Diploma did for me is teaching me how to write a, like, a proper research paper. So. I didn't see Ella today. Did anybody else? No. OK. Annabella. Hi, everyone. I'm Annabella. Um, I'm going to be going to Carleton College next year, studying chemistry for now. But like, honestly, that could change. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank my parents. Thank you, Chad and Jenny. You guys are amazing. Um, but one thing IB Diploma really taught me was that you, it forced me to study things that I never thought I would ever want to study, and like, I never thought I would want to talk about a book for 10 minutes in an enclosed room with a teacher. But <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, like, yeah. So it definitely uh, made sure I was well-rounded. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hana. There she is. Hi guys, my name is Hannah Schechter and I'd quickly like to thank uh, my parents Michael and Kelly. They aren't unfortunately going to make it tonight, but I'd like to thank them all the same. I am going to be attending the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor next year. Not quite sure what I want to study, but I'm kind of leaning towards international studies. 
And what IB has really taught me, like Annika, is to organize a research paper, kind of find out what I like, and kind of construct that into something that's usable and readable. Devin wasn't here either, right? Liam wasn't. Megan! Hi guys, I'm Megan. I like to thank my parents, Michael Perkins, and my mom, Kathleen Perkins, as well as my siblings for sticking with me uh, through this uh, long road ahead um, that I just completed. I'll be attending St. Catherine University, where I'll be running cross country and track. And something that the Ivy Diploma has uh, helped me with was being a more confident and outspoken person. Because if you don't really know me, I'm actually very shy. Once you, once you talk to me more, I'm actually be able to open up. And so I'm very glad that I did the Ivy Diploma. Definitely helped me become a better person. Thanks. Adam. Hi, my name is Adam Johnson, and I will be uh, attending the University of Wisconsin-Madison next year uh, to study engineering. Um, I'd like to thank my parents, uh, Pam and Marty Johnson, uh, for helping me um, through the diploma um, and through high school. Um, what the IB diploma has really helped me with um, is like strengthening my time management skills. It's really, it's, there's a lot of difficult classes and a lot of coursework, homework outside of the class. So really balancing that um, and with sports and everything, um, it's really helped me become better at that skill. Jake. Hi, um, I'm Jake. I would really like to thank uh, my parents, Wendy and Stu, and my twin brother, yay David, um, for helping me with this process. Um, next year I'm going to be going to UW-Madison to study biochemistry. Um, I don't know if that's going to stick, but that's the current plan. Um, and something that IB has taught me has for sure been um, taking pride in my achievements and really knowing that like I've put all this work in and learning how to take pride in that. So, yeah, thank you. Katie. Hi, my name is Katie Fredrickson. I'd like to thank my parents, Mark and Julia, for all their support over the last two years. And I also want to thank the school board for sponsoring such a wonderful program, and not just this rigorous academic program, but also the extracurriculars like athletics and theater and other things that I know made people's high school experience so much richer and more awesome. Um, and I honestly, the IB program was a grind. Um, there's no <laughs> other way to put it. <laughs> a lot of late nights. And so I feel really prepared to go to school and I want to thank the teachers um, for helping me hone my critical thinking skills and also my peers for being, it's just so awesome to be surrounded by such amazing people who are well-rounded and thoughtful and smart every day, all day, in all my classes. It really pushes me to think outside the box in English and bio and chem, all these different areas. And, I, and in a couple of weeks, I'll be heading to Colby College in Waterville, Maine. That's the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> and I will be studying biology and history on a pre-med track, and I will also be rowing crew. Ryan. Uh, I'm Ryan Favor. I'm going to be attending University of Minnesota Twin Cities next year for computer science and probably math as well. Um, one thing that I think IB has really helped me with is being able to formulate ideas and write them down better on my feet, uh, being able to quickly improvise and you know, articulate my ideas clearer. Sam. How's it going, everyone? I'm Sam Bernberg. I'd like to thank my parents, Betsy and Barry. Um, next year, I'll be attending University of Wisconsin-Madison to study business. Uh, the IB Diploma has taught me a lot, 
one of the most important things, I think, is the ability to break down and process information uh, in a way that helps me remember it, but also uh, to make sure I truly understand the material, not just learning it for a test. Uh, and then on behalf of everyone here uh, and everyone who's not here from the diploma, I'd like to thank Ms. Magdal for all her help uh, and everything that she's done for us to help us achieve this goal. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a few students who weren't able to be with us tonight. Thomas Bryant, Olivia Massey, William Phelan, Devin Rayner, and Ella Trotter. Thank you all for your support. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we left cupcakes and cookies downstairs with lemonade, so on your way out, enjoy another bite. But thank you so much for celebrating this achievement with us. We appreciate it. You are not obligated to listen to the business meeting. meeting to order it's Monday August 13th um, we're gonna have the approval of the agenda open forum tonight I don't believe we have anybody who would like to speak to the board the superintendent's report our discussion items include the community education update with director Lisa Green um, a sh very brief we map update from myself the MSB update from those who are able to attend the summer leadership seminar the announcement of our truth and taxation hearing for 2018, our facilities and security update by Director Sarah Thompson, policy development first reading policies 514, bullying prohibition, 515, protection and privacy of pupil records, and 510, school activities, policy development second reading, 506, discipline, uh, the ties resolution, the school board listening session for the upcoming school year, the substitute teacher pay increase with a little bit of remarks from Director Rich Cryer. Um, the school board school liaison building assignments for the upcoming school year. The consent agenda. Our action agenda includes the approval of the date for truth and taxation, the approval of the ties resolution, policy development second reading policy 506 discipline, approval of the proposed school board listening sessions, the employee agreement for Children First Executive Director, the approval of the employee agreement for the assistant principals at Aquila Elementary and the high school, um, the approval of the 2019 school year substitute teacher pay rate, communications and transmittals, and then we'll adjourn. Is there a motion for this agenda? Excuse me, Chair Waters, you missed action number H. Sorry, action H. Oh, thank you so much. Acceptance of gifts to the district, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, now, that piece included. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as stated? 
Moved by Mary Tombeck. Is second. there a second? Second by Jim Benneke. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, that carries 7 0. Um, there is no one here for open forum, so next we will hear from our superintendent, Aston Osai. Good evening, Chair Waters, members of the board. This evening, from our superintendent's report, I would like to highlight three items connected to our strategic plan. Um, the first item that I would like to highlight is our recent move to our new district office location at 6311 Wyzetta Boulevard. Um, on July 12th this, of this summer, um, we as a district office moved out of the high school, and as you all know, we moved out of the high school as part of our facility strategy to create space here at the high school for additional classrooms over to 6311 Wyzetta Boulevard. And I would just like to take this opportunity to thank all of the staff that um, worked collaboratively to make sure that the move went smoothly and that everyone was able to get in and get the, get the support that they need from an unpacking and um, just storage standpoint. So I'm, I'm excited about the potential opportunities, um, not only for collaboration there, but I'm also excited about the opportunities for expansion here at the high school. The next um, item that I would like to highlight as part of my superintendent's report this evening is connected to some very courageous action that um, each of you took this past, um, well, I guess was it summer? Yeah, it was summer, June, in our June meeting where you passed the uh, um, gender inclusion policy. So as part of that, there's professional development connected um, to the policy. And um, on August 28th, we'll have Joel Baum from Gender Spectrum who will be here to provide professional development to all of our staff um, and then in the afternoon of the 28th, also provide breakout sessions that will allow our staff to continue to understand um, the role of gender identity as it relates to learning and achievement here in the St. Louis Park Public School District. And the last item that I would like to highlight as part of my report this evening is an upcoming collaboration that we will be participating in with Hopkins Public Schools and Eden Prairie Public Schools. On Friday, August 17th, the three districts will be collaborating around student leadership development. And I'm extremely excited about this because as we think about not only our mission and strategic plan, but also the work that came out of Reimagine Minnesota, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to elevate student voice and to really understand the needs and wants of our students as we're continuing to develop our strategic direction moving forward. Um, and that includes my update for this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we're going to be hearing from Community Education Director Lisa Green. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Waters, Superintendent Osai, members of the board, and seeing as I'm now the second person with our new plan for presentation, I am going to try to figure out how to get this over to my presentation. Okay, I'm sorry for the delay here, but we will get this figured out. There we go. Okay, seeing this, I'm not new to doing this from Google Drive. Can somebody give me, um, oh, here, presentation. There we go. Thank you for your patience, everybody. So this is the, as Chair Water stated, this is the Community Education School Board Report. This is the things we've been working on over the last uh, school year. And I first want to talk about the theme of this presentation is going to be relevance, because we've been doing a book study on the art of relevance by Nina Simone. And if you've uh, never seen her or heard of her, there is a TED Talk. It's about 12 minutes, and it's very interesting. And we're about halfway through the book now, but we've been talking about how community education can be relevant to the school district, our participants, and the community. And so relevance uh, being the key that unlocks meaning and opens the doors to experiences that matter to us surprise us and bring value into our lives. So as a prompt for our department managers and our program managers uh, for this presentation, I asked them, what do you think is 
you, how your program is relevant to the school district and to the community. And I, I just want to uh, make a point about community. Uh, the community I've stated here is our large community. This is like our aspirational community. Like if we were serving everybody in this community, that's what we're working toward. We know we don't. We're not there yet, but this is what we're going to be working on is how do we get there so we are serving more demographics within, that, within, our, within the parameters of the community that each program area is serving. So I'm going to start with our youngest learners, and that's early childhood family education. And that community is children birth to five and their parents. And so the relevance to the uh, district and the community and to our participants is that in this program, we, the school district welcomes the youngest learners to St. Louis Park Public School. We have a four-week-old uh, in, in ECFE classes. Um, so uh, people are entering into the school district as soon as they become parents. And once they're in, now they're poised and prepared to be taking other classes within community education, and now they're in our system in the school district. So we can communicate with them. So that's a real benefit to us and to them as they move forward in their school career with their child. Uh, also, children experience a learning environment. Uh, parents learn uh, uh, parenting skills. and. Parents meet each other and they, they develop friendships. And I'll tell you, I was in ECFE classes um, 20, 25 years ago, just like Chair Waters, I'm sure other people, uh, in the Osseo School District, and I still have friends, people I still um, see and talk to from that experience. Next, we have our Early Learning 3s and 4s programming, and uh, this is our standard preschool, half-day preschool programming, and that is for children 33 months to a year before kindergarten. And so our Early Learning 3s program prepares children for Early Learning 4s, and Early Learning 4s prepares children for kindergarten. And in, with, in these programs, children gain confidence, they make friends, they learn skills, and just in general get ready for their uh, K through 12 learning experience. Again, parents and families, if they aren't already, become part of St. Louis Park Schools. They are part of our communications program now, and they are in and they are like part of our family. We also have uh, blended classrooms. So uh, as you know, we have, um, uh, typically developing children along with ECSC children and low-income children through our school readiness and pathways too. So children experience a classroom uh, environment that's similar to K through 5. Uh, because we are forced our parent to wear rated in, in um, our early learning uh, program, uh, we uh, receive Pathway 2 money, and because we receive Pathway 2 money, all children in that program are entered in the MARS system, not just in Power School. They receive a MARS number that will follow them throughout their entire school career. Kids Place Preschool, again, that's for children 33 months to a year before kindergarten, but this is for working families, so families who need the child care. Uh, they also are parent aware rated, four star, use the same curriculum as early learning threes and fours. Uh, that, um, and also, as we know, a high quality, safe environment for children gives parents peace of mind when they go to work. And so not only do parents benefit from that, but businesses benefit from parents who are stress free because they're not worried about their children during the day. Um, uh, Kids Place program also prepares children for kindergarten. And we are NACI accredited, and I'm going to talk about accreditation in the next slide. And, um, and sometimes uh, societal uh, influences also add to our relevance. Uh, the fact that there is a, um, a low unemployment rate means we have more two-parent working families and uh, more people needing childcare. So we are adding two preschool sections next year to our, um, to our Kids Place program. Now, kids play school-age care. This is for uh, St. Louis Park students, kindergarten through fifth grade, uh, for working families. This is before and after school care. And this is safe, fun, on-site uh, care for working parents. We, su we support the school day as much as we can. We try to find out what they've been doing in the school during the school day and try to like uh, enhance that experience for them. Um, High-quality childcare. 
Uh, and I would say this is in general for child care, but I would say even probably more so for school-based because the kids are in their school um, all day long, and it helps uh, create more civic-minded um, adults. They have been doing research, and that finds that. Uh, and we are then MAP accredited uh, for our uh, school-age care program. And accreditation does a couple of things. Uh, if anybody has gone through an accreditation process for, uh, for their work or certification or anything, it's a ton of work. I mean, a ton of work. And we do that because it does a couple things. Because we are NACI and MAP accredited, uh, our families uh, can get a higher reimbursement rate on the Pathway 1 money that comes through the uh, uh, parent-aware rate, rating system, and also they get a higher reimbursement rate through the Hennepin County Assistance because we are accredited. Another thing that accreditation does is um, it, makes, uh, it makes us more uh, linguistically and culturally appropriate, and what we're finding is because um, Immigrant families tend, you know, typically will use uh, family, friend, and neighbor child care, but we're finding we're getting more immigrant families into our uh, kids' place programming, and uh, again, another touch point for parents to come into our schools and feel comfortable in our schools, so that's another benefit for us. Our youth enrichment program, this is our uh, youth programming outside the school day for St. Louis Park students, kindergarten through high school, but it's mostly kindergarten through middle school. We just have a few offerings at the high school level. Um, and as we move forward, we're gonna really start working with partners to provide more opportunities for youth in the community. Um, and uh, we're, gonna look, we're gonna look at doing some youth fairs and uh, things like that. Um, we're gonna look at developing some opportunities for youth to experience the racial history um, in Minnesota and maybe even farther uh, outside of our state. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, they really worked on this summer is we had a lot of families this summer because of the way we did, um, we had our targeted services um, students were able to come in the afternoon and they made a huge effort to greet every family and make every family feel like family uh, that a part of our program and ask them what they liked, what they wanted, and to make those connections with people. And you know, strategy three, right, is like we're, con we're making connections with our community. And another, another thing they're going to do is explore having mobile offices. Right now they're in the middle school, so they're able to really have that touch point with the middle school staff and um, students, but they're gonna look at uh, having mobile offices in the elementary schools to get more connection there at the elementary school as well. The Youth Development Committee, that's been undergoing um, a bit of a change over the years, and that is for St. Louis Park students in middle school and the high school. And uh, one of the things, it's like, we're trying to make it um, YDC intentionally more diverse. And so I put give, receive, give. Well, what the heck does that mean, right? So what that means is that our staff at the middle school, and we're really trying to attract uh, students at the middle school because then they move up into the high school. Um, so what they're doing, the staff, is they notice, because we're really trying to engage students that maybe don't have leadership opportunities available to them through other ways, like through National Honor Society or through sports or things like that. And when our staff, are, are, they pay attention to the students at the middle school, and if they see a student that looks in need for whatever that need might be, whether they, it looks like they might need a winter jacket, or maybe they just need um, a kind word or whatever, they try to provide that need and then ask them to come with into the youth development committee and support them and now that student can actually give back so it's give receive give so the student can give back we're looking at more opportunities for service projects outside of the community um, and we're actually creating more student voice so our staff meets with the students they met with them last year at the end of the year and they have now planned out every month for this year with a theme and the themes are things like the dress code and homelessness and um, voting and those kinds of things. So they will plan out their activities around the theme of the month. And looking at career opportunities and um, our summer, we do have a couple of youth staff for summer learning and play and they are always recruited from the YDC program. 
Now we're moving into our adults. So adult enrichment is adults in St. Louis Park and beyond. So we do serve adults outside of the borders of St. Louis Park. And uh, the relevance is this, is we're actually serving community members that do not have kids in school. So we're bringing them into our schools, we're bringing them you know, into the fold of St. Louis Park Public Schools. And we've been really working hard there to attract uh, new adult populations by offering new and robust programming. So things we did last year were uh, the iftar dinner, sweet potato comfort pie, and one thing, I'm just gonna call it the iftar dinner. Uh, we, that is, was billed as an educational experience for non-Muslims to come and, and uh, experience an iftar and learn a little bit more about um, Islam. But what we found is that a number of Muslims came to the iftars so much that we had to add several tables and um, to, ex to experience an iftar with us. And that was amazing that we were uh, able to attract um, that population. Uh, we have been um, uh, offering free-for-all classes and events uh, to bring people in. They don't have to pay, so just come on in, then we hope that they will stay for some of our other programming. We, uh, for the last couple of years, have been offering CEUs to St. Louis Park teachers. Uh, to, uh, for certain classes, and we advertise that periodically throughout the year so the teachers know which ones of our classes are available for CEUs, and that's a very affordable way for them to get CEUs. And we started offering a sliding fee scale to see if that might bring more people in. The senior program, um, also these are adults now 55 plus, but to be realistic, it's really adults who are retired. Um, so in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and engaging older adults in um, intellectual, social, and physical opportunities, it really uh, helps them with their, um, with their outcomes, you know, as far as uh, just having that connection and having a place for them to go to have those connections. So we have our exercise and we have our lifelong learning and arts and crafts and creativity and our social groups. And uh, we're even offering, uh, we even offered a courageous conversation section during the day and it went, people, people came. Uh, so that's, um, we're keep, you know, trying to um, engage our older adults and bring them into Lenox. Adult Options in Education, as you know, is our GED and uh, ESL for Adults program. And the things they've been working on, uh, we know they, they offer high quality programming for uh, adults in the community who want to further their formal education. But uh, one of the things they've really been working on is to bridge their students from the classroom into the community so they become more part of the community. And, so they inform the students of community events, they have local partners come in to share information. We have, of course, the New Americans Academy that I've talked about before. Um, we have 28 volunteers that offered about 1,600 hours in the adult options program, and so these are people who come in and work with the students there, and they build relationships. Um, and then they get to learn more about what's going on through that. Parents of St. Louis Park students uh, are uh, are more involved in their children's education and that's why it's right now one of the problems with the new site is that um, there's no uh, child care there so we're excited that when when we move over to uh, central in a couple of years we will have a child care site because right now we have to send our families who need child care over to Hopkins and we want them back we don't want them in Hopkins we want them in St. Louis Park so that's that'll be exciting when we can actually keep our families here in St. Louis Park um, there's a potluck dinner and, of course, GED uh, graduates participate in a ceremony. And then we don't, we don't, we're not done with them when they're done with their GED. If they want, they can still get help with uh, AccuPlacer and, and uh, help with transition to post-secondary. Project SOAR, that's our Adults with Disabilities community. And uh, we offer um, opportunities for adults, for disabled adults that enrich their day-to-day, -day, foster pride in individual abilities, and promote lifelong learning. And I would say probably most of our adults with disabilities are cognitively impaired, so many of our classes are geared around that. So they get out, they learn new skills, they socialize, uh, they can explore their communities and become more active. And we're continuing to grow the program. Um, if you don't know, that is a consortium with St. Louis Park, Hopkins, Minnetonka, and YZ. Um, 
Um, so we're looking to expand into group homes, so bring the, bringing the programming into group homes and uh, working with other communities like Robbinsdale and Bloomington and to find what's our niche and how are we working with them to, because they offer some different kinds of programming than we do. Our volunteer program, the, the uh, program that we run through Community Ed is for adults without children in school. So this is not parents, this is uh, for other adults in the community. And of course, that provides needed assistance to classrooms. And uh, uh, what many of our volunteers do in the classroom is uh, work with kids, have kids read to them. And what that does is that helps build relationships with adults and students. And students can then see uh, that there is another caring adult in their classroom. And of course it builds support for schools by engaging adults who don't have children in school. So they come into our schools and then they're more likely to support our referendums and things like that. And we have, uh, of course, our other enrichment programs. We have aquatics, gymnastics, kid dance, and this provides a very affordable skills for, uh, for youth. Uh, we can do it more cheaply than the private companies can. And the Community Education um, Advisory Council is um, starting, what we, we started this last spring, we're, we're doing uh, once a quarter, heart of the matter community discussions. And um, you may have seen that in your uh, catalog that came out last Friday. You may already have this. If you don't, you have one now at your table. But we are uh, starting uh, this fall, we are doing, uh, it's called Challenging Racism, the Minnesota Nice Way. And uh, it's a, to help people who have been in a situation when someone tells a racist joke or statement, what do you do? And we're doing this in partnership with the uh, city and Alicia Sojourner, their, uh, their uh, racial equity coordinator. And we, uh, when we're talking about the community for this, uh, we are very aware that the community we're trying to reach for this program is uh, most likely white people who care about this and uh, want to be able to uh, be able to step in and, and do something when they hear uh, racist jokes and comments. And another reason we're doing this is we want to gain exposure and support for the Community Education Advisory Council. We know that people um, are joining committees and things like that at a rate that they used to, so we're trying to figure out a way to just uh, uh, gain exposure for uh, Community Education Advisory Council. And one last thing, I just want to point out that we are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and those uh, hashtags, et cetera, are on the back of the catalog. And I'm open for questions if you have any. I have a question around enrollment. So um, our early childhood learning, how is that? I think I asked the same question last year, and um, how, well, are we filling those classes out? Actually, we're states, filling them quite well time? right now. Uh, we're, we're taking waiting lists and, and have, going to have to work on getting people off the waiting list. Uh, I know they just did uh, two days worth of intakes for our what we call school readiness and pathways families, which are uh, families who uh, you know, may not be able to pay. But we, so we have a funding source for that, so we uh, do intakes for that, and we just did two days worth of intakes for that last week. Um, so I'm feeling pretty good right now that we're, we're getting uh, good registration and we're reaching out to people. I just have a bit of a follow-up on that. With sort of increased role enrollment in the early learning programs, and it sounds like also increased enrollment in the preschool kids' place, we have a lot of preschoolers. And is there, is there any process that you're using to sort of align what they're doing in the preschool programs from kids' place and early learning with what happens in kindergarten? Yes, we have been. Uh, our, our curriculum department over the last several years uh, has included early childhood teachers. 
in like the, the professional development and those kinds of things. And we just keep working to create that alignment between early childhood and kindergarten. I also want to say too, ECFE, which uh, for a long time, you know, across the state, enrollment had been going down, down, down. It's going up, 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 and we've had to actually in um, add sections of ECFE too. So that that program is coming back in, which is great because, like I said, that gets uh, people into our other programs. Lisa, thank you so much for your work and the work of your staff and. Appreciate the update, and they are doing great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the next item on our agenda is a very brief WEMEP update from me. I am serving as um, our board's liaison to the West Metro Education Program. I also was elected clerk of that body. And um, as you know, we took a vote to dissolve the organization, and our school board ratified it. Um, the wind-up process is proceeding. We have Kara Richardson and Liz Lansing, two longtime staff members who are helping us with the process. Um, as of now, the 350 boxes of records have all been sorted, inventoried, and the deliveries back to the school district of record started taking place today. So um, as people who were attached to WEMAP, whether a transcript or employment, um, you need to go back to your home district for data if you are gonna go to grad school or need to verify employment. Um, so I, I feel really good about that. There's still um, some stuff to deal with, and I, I literally mean stuff like furniture, technology, AV equipment, uh, but it is wrapping up, it's going very smoothly, and the end is really, truly in sight. Any questions? Good. <laughs> so now we're gonna have um, the MSBA update. Every year, the Minnesota School Board Association sponsors a summer leadership program. Um, Jim and I went to the Sunday Early Bird, and other people, and went to the Monday session and um, just hear a little update about that. Okay, just briefly. Um, the session on Monday was developing a high-functioning uh, school board. I believe it's the title of it. Uh, even though I believe that the, the school board works uh, together pretty well in general, uh, you can always get better. So I enjoyed that session. Um, on Sunday, there was a breakout session on, on mental health. Um, probably two takeaways I take from it. Uh, one was there was discussion about how kids don't seek out help because of the stigma attached to mental health. And at least one idea for, for countering that is that um, sort of normalize it by offering um, uh, techniques for mental health uh, to all kids. So, so all kids are thinking about it and there would be such a stigma attached to it. And the other takeaway was that uh, how there's sort of a mental health crisis. You know, they're the, uh, the helpers in school dealing with that mental health can get overwhelmed, like the ratio of kids to uh, counselors have gone up and up. Uh, I'm glad to see we hired more help for our counselors uh, in elementary schools. Uh, but in general, uh, we need to um, petition the state for more, more funding and uh, until we get more funding, the best we could do is try and get more help from um, outside agencies who might partner with us. Um, so I'm glad in our recent uh, redevelopment that we're you know, allowing more space in the middle school and high school uh, so that we can bring you know, outside agencies in. So. Thanks, Jim. Ann? Yeah, as Jim mentioned, um, the first session was kind of a uh, motivational um, high performance mindset kind of keynote. Um, the second session, uh, <clears throat> insights into the 2018 legislative session with, uh, with Grace Kelleher, who is MSBA's um, Director of Government Relations. And I had kind of done a little update for us um, last spring after, just after the legislative session ended. So I won't go into that basically the same takeaway this, that it was a mess and nothing happened. <laughs> um, the one, actually the one takeaway I have from that, Aston, in particular for you, as we're thinking about the school safety grants, is that um, she had an interesting recommendation, which was 
that as we're applying for the school safety grants that we actually um, we do apply for everything we're doing not just the exact project we want funded so that there is a record of the need um, that they can then take a, take t into advocacy into the um, into the next cycle. So just an, that was just an interesting recommendation that she made. Um, then actually the that dovetails into the next session I went to, which was a Q and A with um, Commissioner Casalias from MDE, and she mostly took questions about the school safety grant program. And um, I think the main takeaway that people got from that was that you don't have to submit it at midnight, the day that it's due. That they'll take everything the whole day as being um, in sort of in the having been it submitted all on time. So um, I think August 29th is the date for that. I went to uh, personalized learning for all students, which was a session done by the superintendent and a school board member from Eastern Carver County, which was kind of in, an, interesting, um, an interesting session. Actually, that had some cool takeaways for our, um, our learning design, uh, because they talked a lot about how learning design and the, the structure of their classrooms um, really affected their ability or improved their ability to kind of deliver personalized education for all students. And lastly, um, I went to the case law update um, from Kathy Miller, who's the uh, director of legal and policy services for MSBA, which had a whole host of different um, different pieces. So I have I do have the handouts from some of these, so I can pass them down so everybody can can look at those. Um, and I know those quite any questions. That, that's the gist. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, next item is our truth and taxation hearing, and Cindy Bennett is going to give us the update on that. Good evening, Chair Waters and members of the school board. Typically, the director of business takes this uh, subject, but in the absence of a director this time, I will. I worked with Brooks, and we followed the pattern that we've used many years, and so the date for 2018 is December. Where is it? 10. Uh, at 6.30 p.m. in this room, and it will be publicized as such. And this is by state mandate, and we will notify the commissioner and the state that we have presented this to the board this evening, and it's coming up on the action agenda for approval. Thank you so much. Um, the next item is our facilities and security update with uh, Director Sarah Thompson. Chair Waters, members of the board, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I have with me tonight Director of Student Services, Tammy Reynolds, Director of Facilities, Tom Bravo, and Pam Gronsky, who is a St. Louis Park Police Officer and a school liaison. Just one second here. Gonna go like this. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. That's right. As you're all fully aware, we're working on focusing with a laser focus, our mission, our vision. So as a caring, diverse community with the tradition of putting its children first, we will ensure all students attain their highest level of achievement, prepare all students to contribute to society, offer high quality opportunities for learning, provide multiple pathways to excellence, challenge all learners to meet high standards, and we're going to do that in providing a safe and nurturing environment that energizes and enhances the spirit. For our outcomes tonight, we're going to learn about physical and facility safety improvements to secure our buildings, complete in the summer of 2018. We're going to learn about run, hide, fight, or we might say engage, 
as one procedure in our toolbox. We're really talking about having opportunities for multiple procedures instead of the typical we're going to just lock down and barricade and hope that that keeps us safe. Instead, we're going to evaluate the situation that we're in and we won't all be maybe making the same decision, but we're going to share opportunities for people. And at the last outcome tonight, we're going to learn about training and communications plan for this school year, the 2018-19 school year. So my part that I want to speak about is what we have been doing this summer. Um, we are 85 to 90 percent completed in the Peter Hobart secured entrance, which I really want to tell people um, that, I suppose to add, we are applying for every security project that we're going to be doing. Even the ones that we're doing this summer, uh, sometimes they, they kind of look at those as, well, you already did it, so why are you applying for it? But we're applying for all of them, and uh, hopefully we'll get, we get them all. You know. um, new classroom doors at Aquila, Peter Hobart, and Susan Lindgren. Uh, Susan Lindgren's doors are complete. Uh, we're installing uh, Peter Hobart and Aquila this week and next week, right before the teachers come back the following week. Um, what's going to be different on these secure doors is because of the fact that we're going to be changing kind of the format of just not only lockdown, but look at you know, the run-hide fight process is that the doors will have locks that are inside the room. So teachers do not have to go outside to lock their doors anymore if there's a lockdown. They just go up to their door and lock it. And it's always free out because some people said, well, what happens if they need to get out right away? It's always going to be free out, but nobody could come in unless they unlock the door. So that's, that's a feature that we put it in for the elementary schools and all the other buildings as we remodel those buildings. Uh, Peter Hobart in the middle school, of course, we've in, uh, installed quite a few cameras and continue to be installing more cameras. As this process goes on, you're going to see more badge readers, more cameras, more of the systems where then we know who's going in what spaces and so forth for security and reasons. Uh, exterior and, and, of course, the interior blue light systems, those are the systems right now are mainly in the elementary schools. And if there was a lockdown, there would be a blue light in the hallways that flash so that you know, if students don't hear the lockdown itself, they can just see the lights could be flashing pretty bright and blue, plus outside. So if there are buses that are going to be coming to the building uh, and they see the blue light flashing, they know to turn around, not to go to the building itself. Or if there are people out in the playground playing, teachers out there, they'll see the blue light and they'll move to a, a safer spot. So we're getting prepared and ready for, you know, uh, for all the types of uh, options that we're going to be giving our, our uh, teachers. And then, of course, again, the door locking system. Um, I, I don't want to forget Lenox. If you've been over to Lenox, um, you'll see a brand new sidewalk in front because we're going to have one secured entrance, just like all the other buildings. And it's going to be with card access, but also uh, it's going to be easy accessible for our seniors and other programs that are over there. So we're looking at the whole gamut of the district, how to secure it better. Oh, wrong way. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pam Gronsky uh, from the police department, for those of you that, who I haven't met. Um, I was asked today to give a little bit of where we've been and where are we going. So I'm not going to go through every word on this slide, but uh, this has been a conversation that started back in 2014. Um, at that point, I was on my second round as a school resource officer at the, at the middle school. Um, and we started talks with the district. And fast forward to our first real engagement with the staff of the school district was about this time last year. Um, Mr. Osai had come aboard and carried along where um, we had left off and I addressed the entire school district uh, last August. During that presentation, we introduced the idea of run, hide, fight. Um, in the presentation we talked, we really dug into what does it mean to run, what does it mean to hide and barricade, what does it mean to fight or uh, create uh, interruption of somebody that's trying to do harm to us or to our children in our district. Um, during that presentation we also talked about uh, school procedures. What can administrations do? What can the teachers in their classrooms do? We talked a little bit about uh, mental preparation and I'll talk to about a little bit more about that on the next slide. And then we also talked, I also addressed police response. What can administrators, what can students and teachers expect when the police respond, when fire responds, when medical assistance responds? 
Moving forward, uh, where are we going this year? Uh, Sarah and her staff are working on a presentation which she'll address in just a moment. Uh, we are going to continue uh, to do school visits and do thinking scenarios. And that's a little bit uh, what we have done this past year. After the presentation in August, we did some thinking scenarios with all uh, members of the district. And myself and Ms. Reynolds and Mr. Bravo went, along, went around to each location and tried to do some follow-up and, and bring up the, the run, hide, fight philosophy again, try to let our staff members become a little bit more familiar because obviously this is new, it can be scary. Our employee, your employees are in the business of education. So this is something that we want to take very slowly and roll out um, with ease, I guess. Uh, what we're hoping to do is two out of the five lockdowns this year uh, and do something then a traditional lockdown. We want to possibly use other staff members calling a lockdown to the building. Can we use our dispatch center and actually have them simulate an actual lockdown? What would they say? What would they do? Try to get uh, other people than administrators involved in this type of situation. Uh, we also want to do some tabletop scenarios with our building leaders and our principals. Uh, in the last several years, in me talking to um, many of the district administrators, they're asking for commonalities uh, in emergency situations. Let's put some tabletop exercises together so they can all talk and we can, they can come together as a district and decide what are the best policies and protocols when we do have an emergency situation. Uh, and then again, we're going to, um, I'll let uh, Sarah Thompson talk a little bit more about how we're going to introduce this to parents and students as we move into the springtime. Uh, what we're hoping for in the future uh, is to get an actual interactive scenario with all of our district members. Again, this is a hard and sometimes scary thought that we might have to engage somebody that's trying to do us harm. Let's put ourselves in that uncomfortable situation, not only thinking in the thinking scenarios, but let's put ourselves into some physical scenarios too. Uh, we would like to propose an annual meeting uh, on the district level with our local emergency responders so everybody has a clear understanding of who is, who is coming to an emergency situation, what role do they play during that emergency situation. Um, and then lastly, let's uh, take a look at our emergency procedures. And I will let your staff to address that just a little bit more. Thank you, Pam. So I want to talk about what is next. What are our next steps as we head into this school year? So as my, my colleagues have mentioned, um, we're really going to focus on bringing this very big concept to home. What does this look like in St. Louis Park? How does run, hide, fight come to be here? What does it look like? Um, in terms of fight, you've heard different words over time from different resources, encounter, engage. Um, we've gone with fight um, because it's a very quick and easy and very clearly understood um, concept. And so what we'll be doing is um, when all teachers are back on August 28th, we will be introducing a video that is St. Louis Park specific, messaged with our key messages, and talking about our process, our procedure for run, hide, fight. We'll be introducing that to staff. It's just one component of a communications plan that will run through the whole year. Um, and our goal being we introduce this concept to teachers and staff. We do some additional training that Officer Gronsky just explained. And we spend some time. So Tammy Reynolds, Patrick Duffy, um, our principals, our teachers, will engage in some great dialogue around how do we best present this really challenging topic to our students. Because we know that there's not one answer. What's going to work for a kindergartner isn't going to work for a second grader, for sure isn't going to work for a sixth grader, and it's got to be an entirely different mode of action when we get to the high school. So we've really got to spend our time, dig in, figure out what is the right method to teach this topic. And so that's what we'll be doing throughout the year. Um, so that comes spring, really after spring break is what we're thinking for a launch to share this with parents, families, students, um, broader community. So that's what we're looking at. And then as Officer Gronsky mentioned, trainings and drills um, of the tabletop variety. So scenarios, what can we do? What can we anticipate to start getting used to this as a tool in our toolbox is really what we're looking at for this school year. And so with that, we're all available for any questions you might have. Well, it sounds like a lot of really good work, and it's exciting to hear about it. Um, I had a couple of questions. 
Tom, did I understand you to say that all classroom doors are going to have those new security doors in time? In time, yes, they will. And I just would encourage us to expedite that as quickly as we can, not to conflict with the other construction that's going on. Yes, uh, we are doing, we're looking at some of that, but some of it has to wait until the construction starts. And then, and then I, I just wanted to comment on the, on the run, hide, fight. You know, that's um, the company that I work for also has that training and that language that they use. And so I think it's beyond, it's, it's broader than St. Louis Park is what I want to say. And uh, it's, for our company, it's sort of, man, I'm not at home office. It could be different there. In my field office, we have online training and we have online scenarios that, you know, make a choice here. Here's the scenario, make your choice. Here's your scenario, make your choice. And then they tell you whether you made a good choice or a bad choice based on their hypothetical, which is very helpful because it's hard to put yourself in that situation and you don't want to and there's a bit of denial about it. And so, you know, you're thinking scenarios, you're, whatever you're going to be doing, I think is painfully good <laughs> uh, uh, approach to be taking. My question is, um, what's our plan if any of this is either proving to be traumatic for teachers or traumatic for our students? In terms of, of that, we're, we're needing to be careful. We, we've discussed about our staff being the ones first to talk to the students because having, for instance, me, Tom come in and talk to students who have no relationship with me, that's delivering an entire different message than the knowing and loving face that they see every day. So it's about putting in context of age or grade and both about the delivery of it. So we're gonna work with our staff on how to do that. One example was last year when we were working, one of the elementary teachers said, well, I can see us practicing by doing turning this into Simon Says, and I'm gonna prepare them for that in advance. So I think as long as we continue to work with our staff and, and practice, and you use the term what, muscle memory, mental memory, so it becomes something that they're recalling versus the first time they're doing it. I, I'd like to just add on to that real quick, is that we, when we did bring introduce those teachers, we did see some teachers that were very uncomfortable and some teachers okay. that were very emotional. And, but they also thanked us at the end saying, you know, we know this is today's world and we want to be prepared for it because we are here for the children. So we do see that and we're trying to go through, you know, help them get that better understanding. Nancy asked one of the questions that I was going to have, and so um, I think, Tammy, to kind of follow up on that, I'm wondering if specifically when we're getting ready to roll this out to our students, if we can kind of cross-check against IEPs and 504s mm -hmm. for students that we know may be particularly vulnerable in terms of um, anxiety, depression, those mm -hmm. issues, so that maybe there's an opt-out option that parents can mm -hmm. complete for students who just, maybe this, just even hearing it wouldn't mm -hmm. be the best thing. We'll internally talk about how to do that because we also don't want to own having a student be unsafe. Yet at the same time when we do our other drills, that's part of what our special education case managers do. For instance, they know a fire drill is going to set off a student with anxiety or right. with noise. So we've got the headsets ready for them, noise canceling headsets and away they go. So we're just adding this now to that whole genre of, of practicing. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, my other question, or more of a comment really, is that I love hearing, well, I hate hearing about the doors and the blue lights. I think we all do. Um, I'm very grateful that they're there, and I would really love to make sure that our school communities know that we have spent some of their referendum dollars, mm -hmm. that they, the community has um, so graciously granted us in this very tangible, very specific way. So I'm wondering, Sarah, if there is a plan for principals to share this and communicators or at open houses or or how we're gonna roll that out. Yep, so we've we've started some communication with back to school letters, back to school um, newsletters, things like that with our schools and our principals. And there will be a steady stream of that this year um, throughout the construction. So this first summer section was kind of our first um, wave, so to speak, of construction and improvements. And so we'll be reporting that out and then also kind of teeing up the next set of construction and what to expect. And so it'll be a very regular um, process of communication. And also with the run, hide, fight in particular, that will give us an opportunity in the spring to get in front of parents purely on the topic of safety and security to talk once again about the improvements we've made. Tom, I, this is probably happening, but, I, but in, in your short description, you didn't say it, so I have to ask. Mm -hmm. um, 
When I go to 287 as the, as the liaison to that school district, they also have a light of some kind that's in front of their building that you don't go in if it's on. And, but they have a sign that says, if this light is on, don't enter. <laughs> and I would just, if you haven't got that in the plan, I'm going to suggest that because not everybody who's coming is going to remember what that light means or, or is a regular attender to the school just as a, yep. as a follow-up. Uh, we weren't thinking light. about that, but yes, that's something that we could look into also. So we'll do that. Um, this is this is really excellent work, and I really want to point out it is part of our collaboration with our city school district relationship. We're very grateful that we do the work together. Um, uh, Aston and I and Jake and Tom Harmoning had a meeting to prepare for our joint meeting last year, and and this was a key topic that we need to address our current reality and we've had quite a lot of student engagement on this topic. Mary and I were listening to students at the middle school on their walkout day and they want to know that they're safe and, and these are the tangible steps that we're doing to make sure that all of our students feel safe in school. So thank you so much for your work, it's really important. The next item on our agenda is policy development first reading, policies 514, bullying prohibition, 515, protection and privacy of pupil record, and 5110, school activities. Let's, let's start um, in our packet, 510 is the first one, school activities, and um, any thoughts that people have as they took a look at this. I thought all the red line changes looked just fine. Going once, going twice. All right. Let's go on to 514, bullying prohibition policy. Uh, we did take a look at this just in November of last year. Chair Waters and the board, 514 and 515 are on the mandated list with MSBA, which is why you're seeing it again. And we, it's also on the list that Superintendent Osai put together for us to try and get through this year. So this is a, a real good sign that we are keeping our promise to ourselves to keep moving on an annual basis. So that is why it's coming back to you so quickly. And excuse me, there were no changes, either legislative or MSBA, with either policy since we've looked at them. I have a couple um, just typo things, Cindy, that I can, I'll just bring over to you after. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Moving on to policy 515, protection and privacy of pupil records. Again, we just saw that a year ago in November, and here it is again. Just as a reminder, are all required ones we are gonna review once a year? Yes. There are certain policies that MSBA met, um, identifies as mandated policies that they would like us to look at annually. The, these two happen to be part of those. Um, and there are also policies there's also language in, all, in some of our policies that few, previous boards have requested annual review, and we are doing our best to try and catch up with those. So it looks like there were no changes in this policy. There were no changes okay. in this policy either. Now we're on to the um, second reading, 506 Discipline, and we did have a special meeting earlier tonight um, with the staff talking about um, the administrative component to this activity. So the school board sets the policy and monitors it, but the administration implements it and Tammy do you have anything that you'd like to summarize for us from earlier tonight 
I didn't necessarily prepare anything for you, but I did want to uh, sort of remind everybody that the district has been working on some adaptive change with regard to the way we address behavior within our schools. Not that we are overlooking behaviors. We are very intent on keeping our schools highly safe, but in also engaging our students and hearing student voice with regard to how we respond to concerning behaviors within the school day. I'm so sorry, everybody. Can we go back to the bullying one for just a second? Are we still on bullying? Can we go back to 514? Um, yes, we can. What is it, Mary? It's just a brief thing. I'm sorry, but in the definitions, when we are doing the Minnesota Human Rights Act language regarding discrimination and um, D, I would um, ask that we change our language in D3 to mimic what we have done in other policies, which is to um, delete the, the word including sexual orientation, comma, gender identity and expression, comma. We change that language in our other policies um, to reflect more acceptable um, terminology around the fact that gender identity and gender expression is not actually related to sexual orientation. They are completely distinct classifications. I would just like that to be um, parallel throughout our policies. Cindy, is that something we're going to need to consult with Michelle on since we would be stepping away from um, Minnesota State? Le it's a mandate from the state of Minnesota. Karen? I don't think we would. Personally, I don't think so because I don't think it changes the meaning of the statute. The mandate is that we review it. Uh, the board, at its discretion, can make changes. Um, I'm trying to keep a little tickle file where the things where this appears in other policies. So I appreciate the reminder. Um, if that's the will of the board to remove that word going on, then I'll try to watch for that. I think when we discussed it before, it was that that in the state uh, guidelines, it is stated that way, but that we felt that that was actually just factually incorrect, and so we took the word out. Doesn't really change the meaning, but feel it felt more correct to us. And we have we have changed it in at least one policy already. If we are all in agreement, then um, I, I need I don't I just need to see a, a thumbs up that we're all in agreement on that. Can I ask for just I mean removing the word including in that whole paragraph is that what I and then adding a comma after sexual orientation. And I wrote it out, and I can bring it over to you, too, Cindy. Thank you. Sure. Oh, do we have agreement? All right, yes, for the majority of it. Great, very good. 7-0 on that. All right. Back to the policy development, second reading of policy 506, Discipline and the Grid. Thank you for that very nice summary. Tammy, um, any other thoughts that people wanted to share? There is a, a version marked revised at your spot today. Chair Waters, if I could just add the revision, the, the, the policy you had in your packet was a total goof on my part. When I went to click the policy, it grabbed the wrong one, and I missed that. So the revision is compared to the MSBA model, and I was quite shocked, actually, since 2011, which is the last time we looked at this, that there is not a, a great deal of change. I just have made the changes to, uh, to reflect our current policy against this model policy. And then, of course, um, as you can see, where I have the notation of insert grid, which is what we would call our procedures, that's, uh, we have nothing after, after that in our current policy as far as the policy, it shows up in the grid. So Cindy, as I'm looking at this under section four student rights, you have in red, is that an added bullet that would go there? Is that what the MSBA is suggesting, that line that's in red, all students have the right to an education and the right to learn? In MSBA policy, that is the only line that is in student rights. And we have all the other others listed, is that's that what correct. you're saying? That's correct, yeah. Okay. About now, 2010, 2011, there was extensive work on this by the board at that time to 
uh, adapt to the thinking of, of um, the district and the board. So a lot of changes were made in the policy and there was a, a big grid change at that time too. So um, that's the biggest parallel difference, or excuse me, the biggest difference between the two um, with, of that section four student rights is the MSBA just has one line and we have several bullets. We have several bullets. It looks like we've added consequences and a section on consequences and we added a section for special education. And then our, our grid is a procedure, it's not part of the policy. That's what I see is what we've done differently. That's correct. The, the MSBA pol model policy does not have consequences, nor does it have special education. That was added by previous boards. And everything from Roman numeral six to the end is contained in our grid? I am told that that is why the grid was made, okay. um, to remove all of those words and put it into a more usable format for the staff to follow. I have not read it word for word and compared each one to the other. So just to clarify then, in our policy, Roman numeral six on, so from that bottom of page what, 5063, doesn't actually exist in our policy. Not in policy, no. The model policy does not have a grid, which is why all of those from six on is in written form. So Cindy, for when this comes back, does it come back again next time? Or is this our second reading? This is a second reading. Sure, you can bring it back. I just think it would have been helpful to see our current policy as it's printed and this revised policy side by side. That's what would have been helpful to me. And is it in there somewhere? Actually, what's in your packet is the current policy. Very short, two pages, three pages. It's everything in the revised policy up to Roman numeral six. So my inclination would be to go with our policy as it currently exists, just to tell the board what my thinking is and hear anybody else's thinking. This is the biggest difference in any policy I've ever seen where MSBA is lengthy and we've shortened it, but it's because of the grid. And the grid is not part of our policy, it's procedures. Everything after Roman numeral six, including Roman numeral six, is procedures, not policy. And that is the purview of the administration to implement, yes. And on the website, they're listed separately. They, uh, that's, a, that's a statement, I looked it up earlier. They are listed yeah. separately on the, on the website. Right? That is correct. And at this time, I'm told there are no changes to the grid. That is what the team referred to as future work going forward. And that has been under extensive review since last fall a committee was convened I sat in on several of those meetings Mary Tombeck joined after she was seated in January um, and the work has been ongoing not only from the volunteer staff time but then back to the principal level where the implementation is led so that's where we're at at this point. Yeah, and, and you know, based on our past work and our, our meeting, pre-meeting, it is my understanding that uh, um, folks are really working hard to get some common standards across the district and have, have adopted a common reporting form for all the elementary schools. So we're speaking the same language from district to, you know, from school to school. And, Hopefully we're going to get to a point where we're speaking the same language as kids move from elementary to middle school in terms of how uh, we keep our standards high and we support kids in their learning as we teach them how to um, be good learners and not um, disrupt their own learning or the learning of others around them and be respectful in the school environment. 
Well said, thank you. All right. Anything else on 506? So then, if I'm understanding our discussion, we are ready to take the action on it in conclusion of our second reading. Okay, very good. So then we're going to move to our next agenda item, which is the ties resolution. And we're going to hear about that from Superintendent Osai, but um, in the action agenda, we'll need to do a roll call vote on this. Chair Waters, uh, members of the board, if you recall, um, last spring, um, we brought a request to the board regarding rescinding our letter of withdrawal from ties due to the fact that through the process as ties was acquired by Sourcewell, formerly NJ, NJPA, we recognized that there would be significant cost savings in um, maintaining our membership. As a part of um, continuing to be a member of ties and, uh, and ties being acquired by Sourcewell, as a part of that process to be completed, um, ties is asking that each district um, review and um, approve the reorganization agreement and the amended joint powers agreement. Um, this will be one of the required pieces in order for Sourcewell to acquire ties. Um, as a part of the addendum connected to that, as I, as when I shared with you earlier, you know, we were and originally, if we would have withdrew our membership, it would have been $44 per student to withdraw. By maintaining our membership, it was reduced to $17 per student. Um, and then there was an, an additional um, $3 building fee that they were anticipating as they're working to, to sell the property. The addendum um, calls that out more specifically. Um, it also provides some more detailed language around privacy and security of members' data and um, providing some additional la language around building provision language. So essentially talking about the transfer of building assets to current member districts, recognizing that there um, were districts that withdrew um, before the end of last school year. Are, are there any questions that you have regarding the resolution? All right, thank you so much, Superintendent Osai, for staying on top of this. All right, the next item on our agenda are the school board listening sessions. This is an opportunity for us to go out into the community and listen to what um, is on the minds of our constituents. And so we propose two of the three for the 2018-19 school year, Monday, October 15th, and we're still trying to settle on a time and location, and Saturday, January 19th, again, want to settle on a time and location. Um, if those two dates are acceptable, we want to keep working on finding a third date for the spring. One of the things that we are working very hard to be intentional about is when we meet and where we meet to be as accessible to the community, recognizing that we have parents who are working two and three jobs. We have parents who um, can only come to something on the weekend. and so. Um, I, I do appreciate that of my colleagues that we will go to the middle school on a Saturday morning to listen to people and they show up. Um, so we're still trying to find exactly the sweet spot as to what the exact month, day, time, location, but uh, I, I think we have a pretty good start for what we're posting. Yes, Cindy. Superintendent Osai and I spoke about trying to find the third option for you folks tonight, but I need to talk to Tom Bravo about location, construction, and what's open and what's in the future, so that's why I wasn't able to, to uh, bring that forward tonight. So for the October and January, I just need to double check what's open and what's free and what door people can use, et cetera, before we publish. Any other input on that? Yeah. Just one thing is that I went to a couple of very well attended listening sessions last spring and a, and a little feedback that I had um, and Sarah maybe this is mostly for you is just people didn't know what it was and they didn't understand the difference between like an open forum at a school board meeting and a listening session and when do, then when can the school board members talk back and when can't they and so just the more that we can do to really put out what it is and I know we're already doing that but we need to overdo it, I think, because I think people still don't necessarily understand exactly what 
a listening. I don't think it's a great name for it, but we're going to. I think we're keeping it. But just the, the more that we can kind of say, this is what it is. This is what you can do, and what the school board members can do at a listening session, so that people feel um, informed before they walk in the door. This might add uh, information for the board, and I haven't even shared this with Superintendent Osai. I received a call from Delano School District, and they have watched our meet. They have watched our meetings and heard us talk about listening sessions, which I thought was interesting. I don't know if it's a former employee or w how they would do that, but um, they're. Someone in their business department and superintendent's office called and wanted me to explain how we came about doing what we're doing, what the format we use, who can go, who um, who reports out, um, and they were very very pleased with our, my information. And they asked me what with what I thought the uh, product productivity rate or the acceptance rate, and I shared what I thought was the the view of most of the the boards that I've worked for in 12 years that. Uh, some years it's, um, you know, depending on the, the climate of the, the school district and what might be important, whether it be negotiations or something else, and then sometimes the room is packed. Um, and then, but, but for the most part, it's an average between six to 20 people that want to come and have, you know, open dialogue with two or three members, no more than three of the board. So the, mis the information was well received, and I believe Delano is going to copy our style. And actually, that reminds me, Brooklyn Center has copied this as well. And, and it comes out of um, when we as board members go to our MSBA trainings and meet our other colleagues. And how do you, how do, you do your work in the community? And um, what is important for people to understand, this school board meeting is our meeting. And we're not engaging with the people who come to watch the meeting. We're not having a dialogue. This way, although the, the layout of our desk kind of makes it look like we are, but the listening session we can. And, and the reason it's only two or three members is we don't want to have a quorum in order to violate open meeting law or take some type of official action. The, the goal truly is a dialogue with people in our community and, and listening and responding to um, joys and concerns. So we're going to keep it up. Thank you. Next up, um, Director Rick Cryer is going to talk to us about the substitute teacher pay increase. Um, so the substitute pay um, has not changed since fall of 2015. And um, while we were doing pretty well filling um, our jobs, we noticed a, a fall off as the year went on, especially towards the spring. Um, so we, we did some surveying, we looked at uh, competitive districts um, or, or competing in districts around us, and um, we found that the average starting salary, uh, you know, or the average daily rate is about $125 a day. Um, for casual, we were at $115. And um, the average uh, for um, a longer term, or we, what some districts like ourselves pay for, let's say, um, the loyal sub who puts in more time, uh, you know, we have after 40 days, you bump up to a higher rate in St. Louis Park, and retirees are also paid at the higher rate, and um, that's $135 a day. Um, so that's what we're recommending to the board. The other um, thing that we feel is important and want you to be aware of is we are moving uh, the model and we're moving to um, using teachers on call to provide more support than I think we can provide uh, with one sub caller. Um, they have multiple uh, call people, call center people. We have a dedicated specialist, but when that dedicated specialist is sick or t you know doesn't call in or co goes on vacation, they have other resources that are available there to continue to make the calls and fill the jobs. So um, we are very excited to, to give this a try this year. It's new for us. Um, some of our um, uh, surrounding districts use Kelly services or teachers on call. They're the same uh, Kelly services bought teachers on call and they're kind of merging the operations together. Um, so it's something new for us and uh, we thought we needed to be competitive with the rates um, out there. Okay, that's going to come up on our action agenda. 
Um, the school. Oh. I mean, we, I could say this on the action agenda. I can say it now. I'll just jump in and say it now. I think it's good work to keep us competitive so we get the substitutes that we need. I, I think um, it looks like that most of the impacts maybe going to be $32,000, and that's a projection. It could be less. I would like to ask if we could get a report back a year from now about how this worked, how the new service worked, and um, what the costs really were, and maybe we'll have to adjust our rate again. Who's to know? Um, board members, um, um, Superintendent Osai. Um, yeah, we do look at it as, you know, if we used exactly the number of subs we used this year and we paid the, this higher rate, um, it should, you know, it should mathematically turn out to 32,000. Um, we're looking at, you know, how are we using subs? Are we using subs when we maybe wouldn't need to? If we could reduce the number of substitutes by 250 days um, over the 3,000 and 200 days or so that we used last year, um, it would be cost neutral. So, uh, yeah, we'll come back next spring and tell you how it worked. Um. If you use the Kelly services, <clears throat> do they get paid our rate, or is there a standard rate for Kelly? Or? Um, yeah, good question. Um, the, we set the rate, um, so you know, if, if we decided to keep our rate, uh, they they would use our rate and keep plugging away. But um, um, I think it's better for us to be um, competitive with the neighbors, and so we set that rate. And I suppose then, if um, they didn't like our rate through Kelly, they could still turn it down. Then so. Um, the unfortunate part about using a service like uh, ASOP, which is the absence management system that's very commonly um, used, is that the substitute, once they have an ASOP or frontline absence management account, they can see any opening across all the districts. So they can see Edina, they can see Hopkins, they can see Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis, and they know what the pay rates are when they choose those jobs. So it's a buyer's market with this tool because they, they're not locked into just St. Louis Park. Um, they can pick the day and the district that they most like to sub. That's why it's very important for us to not try to compete on salary, but try to compete on being welcoming and engaging to our substitutes. So how far behind do you think we were in terms of timing? So in terms of the other districts getting to a higher rate, and are we a year behind, or, or were other districts in 2016 at 125? Uh, or did, I suppose it varies. So. There, there, were, there were a couple districts that you know, moved to a higher, Minneapolis moved to a much higher number, but I, I would actually say that we don't necessarily compete with Minneapolis. You know, we, um, uh, so some other districts, you know, made a move last year and we didn't because our fill rates were uh, in the 98% on a, you know, on most days, 100 to 98% most days. So um, we saw a, a, a bigger decline in the spring when Hopkins went to teachers on call and they had a much higher rate than we did. Um, they were they were they came in at this 125 um, or 130 for a casual. They have a little different structure for their loyalty amount. We're a little better on the loyalty amount. We're a little worse on the casual daily. But I think what happened is people started with Hopkins because the the, the casual rate was higher, and then they earned their bonus and then they stayed with them. So um, we saw a drop off and people, um, when Jules was making phone calls, well, Hopkins pays more, you know, and so we, we lost a number of, of those casual swing subs to Hopkins. Do we have visibility through teachers on call for specific teachers, how many days they've worked for us and how many days they've worked for Hopkins, how many days they've worked for Edina? Or? Uh, no, we know how many days they worked for us. Um, and because it's our system and we still own our ASOP software, it's um, uh, teachers on call would, let's say, be a user of our software as Hopkins would have the same software and then it's a web-based software. Thank you. Rick, thank you so much. Appreciate that. All right, the next thing to talk about, um, school is starting very soon. 
teachers are coming back soon, but the first day of school is Tuesday, September 4th for grades one through 12. And our liaison assignments are gonna be as follows. Ann Casey, the liaison at Aquila, Nancy Gores at PSI, Jim Benneke at Peter Hobart, Mary Tombeck at Susan Lindgren, Joe Tatalovich at the middle school, and Ken Morrison at the high school. So if you have a particular concern related to one of those schools, please seek out that particular board member. Um, although we all do care about all of the schools, but that just kind of gives us a little bit of efficiency. Um, thank you so much for that. And now we're moving to the consent agenda. So the consent agenda packet was given to you earlier. Is there a motion? Moved by Ann Casey, is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison. Uh, uh, we do not discuss it. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, that carries 7-0. Our action ag agenda item A, approve the date for truth and taxation, December 10, 2018. It is recommended that the school board approve the date of December 10, 2018 at 6.30 p.m. as the truth and taxation hearing here in room C350 as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mary Tombeck. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries 7-0. The approval of the ties resolution. It is recommended that the school board approve the ties resolution required for the ties reorganization as presented and this uh, roll call vote will be required. And uh, Director Tafalovich. First we need the motion. So moved by Ann Casey, is there a second? Second by Jim Benneke. Any discussion? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Joe. Gores. Aye. Tom Beck. Aye. Morrison. Aye. Waters. Aye. Benneke. Aye. Casey. Aye. Tatalovich. Aye. Seven zero. Thank you. That carries seven zero. Item C, policy development, second reading policy 506 discipline. It is recommended that the school board approve reading of policy 506 discipline as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison. Any discussion? Aye. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. That carries 7 0. Item D approval of proposed school board listening sessions. It is recommended that the school board approve the proposed dates for listening sessions for 2018 19 as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Mary Tabak. Is there a second? Second by Ann Casey. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. That carries 7-0. Item E, Employee Agreement, Children First Executive Director. It is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between Independent School District Number 283 and the Executive Director of Children First, Karen Atkinson, for the 2018 through 2020 school years as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Ken Morrison. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jim Benneke. Any discussion? Good. Um, I, I don't know, Rick, did you work on this particular contract? And if so, could you maybe just give us a quick spiel about how we came to what we came to? The Children's First Coordinator, or now called Children's First Executive Director, title change, uh, same function, um, uh, was... Uh, has been around for a long time and um, is is currently on the payroll of St. Louis Park Public Schools as a 
you know, there are, it's the St. Louis Park Public Schools employee, but it's fully funded by the Children's First Initiative. So all of the uh, expenses that um, run through our system are then charged back to Children's First and covered. So there's no fiscal impact to the district for this position. Um, the Children's First Executive Committee, which includes uh, Superintendent Osai, uh, met, looked at the terms and conditions of employment, and um, they took some action this year to uh, make this position more similar to the uh, school district professional employee group. Um, for whatever reason, for years, there just was, you got this and you got this and you got this in terms of benefits, but it didn't really align up with anything that any of the other groups had. And so they took a little more effort this time to say, well, why, if this is a professional position and it's rated on your system at this rate, and why wouldn't it be paid and have benefits similar? So most of the changes you see are bringing this in line with the uh, professional employee group. Thank you. Are you saying that we're just the fiscal agent for this group? And if so, why would we have anything to do with this? Um, correct. Um, so that's a good question. It was asked to me many times. So um, we, we are the fiscal agent, but Karen Atkinson's Karen Atkinson is our employee. We uh, we get we issue her W two. Um, you know she's on our payroll, and so um, it's my belief that for us uh, in human resources to pay anyone anything, we have to bring it to the board for approval, whether or not we're reimbursed from another organization. But we are fully re reimbursed for her salary and benefits. Correct. We are fully reimbursed for salary and benefits, but again, you know, as a board, you're taking that risk that you're going to get reimbursed. So we bring this to you. This is the agreement. Children's First, a great partner with the city, Park Nicollet and the school district, um, you know, has always been a good partner. So they've always, you know, paid back the expenses. And there's an out clause if you get to the very end. If there aren't, if there aren't funds, the position immediately ceases. And, um, so the employees aware of that as well. Rick, thank you so much for taking the time to do that. Um, we're now ready to vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 7-0. Next item, approval of employee agreement assistant principals, Aquila Elementary, Tolzine and High School, uh, Bussey and Gagalai. Did I say that right? Gagalai? Um, it is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between Independent School District 283 and the assistant principal of Aquila Elementary, Olivia Tolzien, as presented. And um, we'll take the motion in the second and at the discussion hear what you have to say about that, okay? Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Please all second. They are separate motion. I have list them as each one's going to be voted on separately. Second was by Mary Tombeck. And the discussion? Tolzine at Aquila. I'm so sorry. I got asked a question. I was um, uh, pondering my own thoughts. Uh, so um, just one one comment in general about all of these. Um, all of these positions are covered by the principals association contract. So their terms and conditions of employment are spelled out by an agreement that the board has already approved. All right. Um, the fact that the board also approves these individual contracts is an artifact of St. Louis Park Public Schools. I don't know that you always will wish to do this, but um, since we haven't hired a principal in a long time, and and um, well, I mean, the 2015 we did, but we also uh, we haven't come back to the board and say, do you always want to approve these individual contracts that are governed by the contract that you already approved, or should they be just part of the consent agenda? Um, of new hires like any other new hire. So um, until we have that discussion, we brought these back. Um, Olivia Tolzine at, uh, at Aquila Elementary. Um, this is a new uh, 
position that we're trying out. We converted one of our TOSA positions to provide a little more leadership and supervision uh, in, in our elementary schools. And um, it's an experiment that we're excited about, um, providing that level of extra support to the schools. Um, Olivia functioned as the IB coordinator at Aquila uh, previously. She'll still have a, a role overseeing the IB work, but she'll also be able to do observations and help with um, um, you know, any kind of student discipline or um, employee supervision items that um, a, a regular um, non-principal could not do. Oh, just a quick reminder what uh, Tulsa is. TOSA, uh, thanks, teacher on special assignment. So uh, uh, we categorize, our, we have our classroom teachers and then our specialists who aren't classroom teachers but play support roles like IB coordinator, PD coordinator, reading intervention specialist. Some of the other um, specialist positions are flagged as TOSA or teacher on special assignment. Yeah, I had, I had two questions, one, and I don't know if they're, one is certainly for Aston, one may be for you, Rick. Um, one of the questions is why an assisted principal at only Aquila and not the other schools? Because I'm getting that question from folks, and I know Aston told us, it, but I'd love to hear it again. And then the other question is, is this a pilot contract for an assisted principal? Are we locked in down the road if we approve this or if we try this out for a year and we're thinking this isn't such a, we need, this isn't working, we don't want to go this direction with more assistant principals, are we able to, or whenever this contract ends, are we able to end it? That's my question. Um, um, yes, yes, we would be um, able to end it. This is, um, um, you know, the, she would be the only elementary assistant principal, and therefore if we cut one elementary assistant principal, she would have rights to return back to a teaching assignment uh, within the district. Um, it is a, it, it was a unique um, circumstance of timing. Um, I have been talking about this with Rob Metz and then with uh, Superintendent Osai since I've got here, talking about um, providing additional supervisory support instead of uh, when we have teachers on special assignment giving direction to teachers, many times we get the phenomenon of, who are you to tell me what to do? You're in the same bargaining unit as I am. You're a teacher, I'm a teacher, you know, so thanks. And um, so, you know, uh, 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 we believe that providing, uh, instead of a TOSA in this case, a 10-month assistant principal position, uh, which is a little longer than the teacher on special assignment contract, but less than a normal full 12 month principal year, um, will be a good support to the, um, uh, to Aquila. Why not all of them, okay? Um, uh, we, we had a unique situation where Olivia Tolzine was um, offered and uh, looking to leave our district as a um, uh, she was going to, she, she had an offer to be an um, assistant principal in another district. Um, so I went to the superintendent and said, well, now that we have this vacancy, uh, we could either refill with a uh, teacher on special assignment PD, I, IB coordinator, or we could move to this new model of having an assistant principal. Um, we all talked about it as a leadership team and thought it would be, um, uh, it would be bad form to have Olivia leave and then decide after she left to then say, well, we're going to make it an AP now that you left. So we, we told her, hold on, before you fully accept, we're going to move in this model, we're going to post it, and you're going to have to apply, uh, but we'd like, you know, we'd like to, you to apply if, if you would like. Um, so in other schools, we would have to at this point, we would have had to lay off a teacher, potentially, to then move to this model um, in other, you know, in other schools. So uh, we weren't looking to cause that kind of disruption, and we thought this was a unique opportunity to try this. If it works, we could be looking at this in other dis or in other schools. Yeah, and if if I could add, so thank you for that uh, summary, uh, Rick. I, the piece that was unique about Aquila. So as you all know, Aquila is our our largest elementary school, and as Rick talked about it was it was around so 
being that it's our largest elementary school, it has the most teachers, which requires the most performance appraisals or observations from an instructional leadership standpoint. So what made the opportunity particularly unique at Aquila is that it met a large site support um, phenomenon that we've been, we've been thinking about or exploring, and um, the timing just so happened that the vacancy appeared there. I, I would suggest that if this would have happened at another elementary school at the same time that had lower enrollment, that um, we may have not made the same decision. But because of the, the high enrollment at Aquila, um, it presented a, a a proper opportunity to pilot this idea. We've we've heard, I heard last year, I know Dr. Duffy has heard um, as he's come in and all several cabinet members that engage with leaders regularly that there is a um, desire to be um, in a more instructional leadership um, type of position and having an additional leader at the site to support with the additional performance appraisals that are required with more staff allows for more of that. So we're, we're going to try it out. And um, I appreciate the question about well, what happens if we decide that this isn't the model. And as, as um, Rick said, if we cut our only elementary principal position, that there's nowhere for that person to bump into, except for back to um, the classroom, if they so choose. I just want to highlight that Ricky mentioned that part of um, Ms. Tolzien's responsibilities will be some discipline work, and I think that that um, couples nicely with uh, the discipline work that's going to be happening throughout the rest of the district to have a teacher uh, and with teacher training and teacher professional development in that area to be heading up um, or taking on a bigger role in that responsibility at Aquila, and I would love to see how that works out over the next year as well. All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. Opposed? That carries 7 0. The next um, contract it is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between Independent School District 283 and the assistant principal of St. Louis Park High School, Todd Gagalai, and um, Jessica Bussey as presented. Anything else that we need to hear about that circumstance, Rick? Um, just looking at them together, um, you know, this was a um, circumstance where we um, had a, you know, a, a both elementary or both high school uh, uh, assistant principal positions were were open for ver for various reasons. So we posted for both. Had a great um, group of applicants. Um, the selection was. Um, you know, pretty rigorous through the, uh, the department's heads at the high school. Um, uh, these two rose to the top and we're, we're delighted. Um, the discrepancy or the, if you see a difference in pay, um, uh, we have Jessica is in a 10-month assistant principal position and um, Todd is in the 12-month um, assistant principal position. Is there a motion? Well, I'll make the mo it's written to be separate motions, so um, so I'll make the motion for Jessica Buzzy as presented. All right, so motion by Nancy, second by Mary. Any discussion on Jessica's contract? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nope, that carries 7-0. It's the jump in the pages. That's what's getting me. It is recommended that the school board approve the employment agreement between independent school district number 283 and the assistant principal of St. Louis Park High School, Todd Gagalai, as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Jim Benicke. Is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 That carries 7 0. All right, item G approval of the 2018 19 substitute teacher pay. It is recommended that the school board approve the new rate of pay for St. Louis Park substitute teacher from the current rate of $115 per day 
to $125 per day for casual subbing and from $130 to $135 per day for subs who work over 40 days each year in St. Louis Park as presented. This change in rate would be effective for hours work starting 9-4-2018 with the start of the new school year. Is there a motion? Moved by Ann Casey, is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? That carries 7-0. Uh, item H, acceptance, acceptance of gifts to the district. It is recommended that the school board accept the gifts to the district with gratitude in the amount of $16,958.50 as presented. Is there a motion? Moved by Jim Benneke. Is there a second? Second by Ken Morrison. Um, the discussion part that I would like to say is we're not going to actually call out any individual entity at this point, but it is um, state law that we recognize that our district received these gifts in this totality, and we are very grateful for our community partners who help us do some unique things with these funds. So. Having said that, all those in favor oh, say, oh. whoa. <laughs> Karen, I'm grateful that you're getting this on the agenda because we've been meaning to do that. But my question really is, um, are these individual gifts and in smaller amounts that came to us and you're just giving us a collective number or is this any kind of a large gift with strings attached that we as a board should be considering? And that's, I think, the purpose of our approving it, right. so that we know those sorts of details. So I just need to ask that question. It's attached oh. in the agenda. It's the detail is in there, and to my understanding, there are no particular tails as these funds were received. They're all designated funds. Last two, page, last two pages of the agenda. The last two pages, the very oh, last two pages. The packet. Okay. The packet, I'm sorry. If I may add, we did research two, for sure, three districts. And this is, uh, it, it can be done in consent as well, but uh, most districts, we would, I researched Osseo and Elk River, it is done as an action item so it can be publicly called out. And if it's on the consent agenda, it would just fall under the consent. So not to identify each donor. Uh, in the future, if there were to be, a, there's certain, certain donations that need to be called out by a resolution, none of these not fall in that category. And, and this is within uh, a month. Um, is, is these are June's be, gifts. Okay, so that's gonna we be are moving forward as a monthly? Yes. We are moving forward, we've come on the business meeting. Yep. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Do you have something, Ann? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? That carries 7 0. At last, communications and transmittals. I'll start at my end. Um, I just have to, I'm our liaison to the um, Intermediate 287 school board and have been for years and um, and that is a district that does amazing work with a lot of students that have some special challenges and, and their their higher needs many of them and, and if we were to provide that programming here it would cost us a lot more than consolidating with other districts I just say that as a background um, we all as a board member have an invitation to a ribbon cutting ceremony for a building that has been added to and some programs have been consolidated there uh, so uh, it'll be more cost efficient uh, to deliver the programs we hope. And the reason for talking about it in particular is that the name of the building is changing from Edgewood to Ann Bremer Education Center and having um, served on the board when Ann Bremer was the chair for years and a member of West Tonka um, and died recently after a struggle of a couple of years with pancreatic cancer at a relatively young age. I just want to say how proud I am that we are able to name a building in her honor to honor her work um, on behalf of students and it's going to be a delight to be at this ribbon cutting ceremony for the Ann Bremer Education Center. It, 
if, if I could just take a moment and um, welcome and introduce uh, a new cabinet member. Uh, Dr. Patrick Duffy joined us this, or well, just over a little bit over a month ago, as our director of curriculum and instruction. And um, he's uh, <laughs> so he's been on the team for a little bit over a month and has been a tremendous addition. We're excited to to work with him and be in collaboration as we move forward with trying to ensure that each student actualizes our mission here in St. Louis Park. So welcome. Um, and I also know that he is looking forward to and eager to spend some time meeting with each of you if you're interested. So we announced our school liaisons and we talked about day one and that is a big deal here in St. Louis Park. We want to greet the students with a lot of enthusiasm at the elementary's bubbles at the middle school and high school with cheers. So. Other people are welcome to join us, welcoming our students back to day one, not just school board members and staff, but community members as well. Tuesday, September 4th, we'll see you there. Uh, I have a couple things. Um, the St. Louis Park Emergency Program, better known as STEP, is going through their back to school program now. If you go to their website, STEP, slp.org you'll find information on how to donate to the program uh, you could donate funds you can donate um, supplies and it gives very detailed list of the supplies uh, the supplies are needed by August 16th tonight is August 13th so you should get on it uh, and then it's also there's also um, some information for folks who, who need the supplies so they can uh, go to that same website and, and find the information on how to um, obtain the su supplies and, and uh, the times that you can go there or setting up an appointment to do that. Uh, the other thing um, to mention, uh, again, tonight is Monday, August 13th. Tomorrow is Tuesday, August 14th, which is primary day. So I'd encourage all of you to go out and vote. There are plenty of articles out there about the uh, education views of the, the candidates. Uh, so, um, and also to note, you can look at the St. Louis Park website to see where your, or, or the Secretary, Secretary of State website to see where your um, polling site is. And I believe I, I just saw earlier today that if you go to the St. Louis Park website, it will tell you about any sort of construction situations at your polling place. So we know full well that at a couple of the um, uh, elementary schools, we've got construction, so it gives you some information on where to go in in order to vote. And normally on a primary day, although this will be higher uh, turnout prediction alert uh, <laughs> than it has been, it will still be pretty light and you can get in and out uh, relatively quickly. So that is my encouragement to vote tomorrow, August 14th. Anything else? I do have one quick right. thing. Thanks, I remember that Aston and I attended the um, AMSD Board of Directors meeting last week and there were two presentations, one on the um, the Cruz Guzman decision that went through the Minnesota Supreme Court, which they didn't rule on the case, they just sort of sent it back. They allowed it to go back. Um, to where it was, so it is still in progress and will probably be for a long time. Um, and one on um, a program that is being developed to encourage um, recruitment and retention of teachers of color. Those materials are on their website, they're just available to the public, so if you're interested you could um, look at those materials on AMSD's website. All right, so um, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Nancy Gores. Is there a second? Second by Mary Tombeck. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 7-0. We are adjourned 9 9 p.m. Thank you.